evening. I'm Gracelyn Guile, and welcome to Gracelyn Presents Local Nonprofits That Are Inspiring. Um, tonight's guests are from Groton Open Space Association, which is called GOSA. And I welcome Joan Smith, is the president, the current president, and Sydney Van Zant is the former founder and current vice president. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. I really admire what you've done and what you're doing, and so I would love to share this with our guests, and I'm so glad you could come. Sydney, please tell me, what in your background made you want to start an open space preservation organization 50 years ago in Groton? Well, I came from, uh, I grew up on what is now the Mayanus River Gorge, mm -hmm. and that Mayanus River Gorge was turned out to be the very first piece of property bought by the Nature Conservancy, and I grew up in those woods. Oh. And when we moved to Noank um, in 1961, actually we had been in that area before, um, there was a farm there at the Haley Farm, and um, it supplied the milk to this whole area. And so suddenly uh, the developer wanted to sell it and they wanted to change the zoning to duplex housing, which would have had 250 duplex housing on the Haley farm. I thought, you know, um, I don't think that's acceptable. I don't think we can do that. And so we worked with the state and then we got uh, help from the Connecticut Forest and Park Association, which is a statewide um, environmental organization, to act as our umbrella. And they were a nonprofit, so mm -hmm. they sent out the brochure that we developed um, to raise basically the town's portion of a town state federal open space grant. And so it was done by um, uh, cake sales. And, and kids with horses would have people give rides, and um, there were um, uh, food uh, uh, sales at churches. And um, then Ambie Burfoot, who won the Boston Marathon, whose teacher was Johnny Kelly, who won the Boston Marathon, all those kids ran from Fitch Senior High School, which abutted Haley Farm, and that was where they would run down there, they would run to the end of Bluff Point, that's over a thousand acres, which actually now is open space. And so they were promoting it. And Amby had this, this idea of having a, a giant a music festival, and he had it at the largest thing at the municipal auditorium. And the, the mayor was not happy at all. And suddenly we became front page news in the newspaper to see how we were doing. And by golly, we had until March 15th to finish the $50,000 fundraise, which probably was about 400000 in today's, today's dollars. Today's dollars, right. It's a lot of and, money. And so we did it, and we got there by March 15th, and so in 1970 was when it was saved, and we came out in Life magazine, and under a title called Battles Won, there were about eight properties across the country that were included along with the Haley Farm. So that we were amazing. really pleased. So it was really a grassroots effort. It was totally grassroots. And you spearheaded it. I was one of the founders and uh -huh. president for 16 years until uh, my husband and I left the area uh, for to our little To go sailing, one, as To I build recall. a boat and sail around the world. And then we came back and, and, and I came back into it. But mm -hmm. hardly had we had we stopped the, saving the Haley Farm was that Bluff Point had major development coming in, and I was one of the, um, uh, the, the head of the Bluff Point Advisory Council working with all of the various parts of, of the, the town and the state, and finally the governor said, too much pressure, we've got to save this. So he basically condemned it and said it's for all people, and so there's a crossing at the railroad tracks and that's over a thousand acres of open space. So, the the Haley Farm was actually 275 acres, and then the addition of Bluff Point, which connects to Haley Farm, it does, is made it a thousand acres over. 
over a thousand acres yes. that you were able to preserve. And how many years did that take? Because the well, we started in. I personally started in 1965, mm -hmm. and and we we finished with the Bluff Point thing in 1974. But the thing that's interesting is that um, the DEP numbers in 2014 said there were for over 400 people that came to Bluff Point and Haley Farm. That and also the state gives the town taxes uh, funds in lieu of taxes for that property every year. Okay, so to maintain it. To maintain. Think of the tourism that yes. gets brought yes. to the town of Groton by those two pieces of property. And that's amazing. And and nobody ever talks about the, the, the possibility that if you preserve something that's of value to the community, then it can actually bring in funds to that's support exactly itself, right. which so is wonderful. So people stay in hotels and they eat in restaurants and they fill up their gas and the gasoline, they go to the grocery store right? and make and sandwiches. They pay admission to parks? Well, not in these not two. In these two. These okay. are free. Okay. All these right. are free. Wow. <laughs> that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So... What was, let me just step back a minute and ask you to just say, what was Gosha's initial mission and how has it changed? Well, it's evolved. Um, our initial mission when we were first formed was to uh, save open space for conservation. Mm -hmm. um, it has changed quite a bit. The emphasis almost is on preserving water because we have saved um, the Merritt Family Forest and Cheap Farm, Candlewood Ridge, um, the Avery Farm, and all of those are part of the watershed. And all of those okay. are, pre are protecting streams. Like the Sheep just, Farm stream runs into, Palmer, into um, uh, Mumford Cove, and the Merritt Family Forest runs into Palmer Cove, and then the watershed at the Avery Farm that we just uh, purchased Mm -hmm. also goes to the Mystic River. It goes down and takes a sharp, sharp left and goes to the Mystic River. So by watershed, just for viewers, watershed, please explain that all of this coastal land is basically uphill from the ocean. And That's so right. everything eventually And these are ends. all ridges and they're vernal pools all over the place and they're mm -hmm. streams coming from either farther north. And mm -hmm. so they all run down either into the reservoir with most, most of our properties run into the reservoir, but they also run into the streams that run, run into Long Island Sound. Right. And Long Island Sound is a $5 billion um, investment, not investment, that we get mm -hmm. uh, every single year, not one, once ever, forever. This is once a year for it the whole year. It generates much business to it, this area. Yeah, think of all of the boatyards with the boats hauled out. Yeah. Think of all of the marinas with the- All the restaurants, all the- All the everything. Hotels, this yes. is vacation land. This is vacation land. Right, people ask us where we go in the summer and we say, we stay here. here. We stay right here. comes here. Right, so. but one of the things that I didn't say was that um, we do a lot of work, um, stewardship on all of our properties, including the Haley Farm. And for 30 years, we have paid Tom Crowley of Stonington family to cut those fields. And we'll be seeing his tractor there, hopefully this weekend, to cut the open fields. The mm -hmm. state does the little areas and the, and the walkways, but mm -hmm. the big fields are cut and paid for by fundraising of GOSA. Okay, so you still have to continue to raise money for oh, that yes. and other programs that we'll talk about shortly. Yes. So, um, and so you've talked a bit about the the arrangement. Do you want to talk any more or go in more depth about DEEP's Open Space Fund and the Long Island Sound and the other areas that give funding? Well, I think I'll turn that over to our president because okay. she, is, she is the <laughs> okay. queen bee who has written and put together the grants for applications to help us buy the property that we have bought since the Haley Farm was And saved. I'm going to ask her about that because what she's done is incredible. But I want to start by first asking you, what motivated you to join the board and to become a part of this? And when did that happen? Well, uh, let me back up. We chose to move in the area because our house was close to Haley Farm. Oh, so okay. I didn't even know Sydney and all her efforts, but it's a beautiful park and the, be uh, the house is close to Cove. Palmer Cove. Mm -hmm. And so after f um, a few years, my neighbors introduced me to the people in Gosa. And mm -hmm. 
they were leading uh, an effort then to stop the town from putting fill uh, road sweepings into the back of the town hall annex. And they were also fighting a, um, a proposal by the Parks and Rec Department to cut the trees at the Mortimer Wright Nature Preserve in order to pay for the skateboard park. So, so that's when trees. that's sort of when I came up and said, "Oh, okay, <laughs> that sounds like right up my alley." These are the guys who saved Haley Farm, and uh -huh. they want to protect what we already have, uh -huh. and not let trees be sold for skateboarding. Yeah, so, I mean okay. there is a place for forestry mm -hmm. and lumbering within a forest management, but this right. is this they is were going to take the best trees, of course, to profit for right. them. Right, right. And uh, and then after that. Uh, there was um, a subdivision that was going to go in in the Mumford Cove area, mm -hmm. and we asked, and I, I identified that we needed to have a setback from the cove to prevent runoff. Right. And from so the... I went to the ghost of people and said, "Would you back me up if I went to try to try to push to have mm -hmm. some kind of vegetated buffer?" Uh -huh. And they were behind me. I felt like they always had my back. Uh -huh. And it just took off from there. Good, good. Well, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so now I want to know, you have authored, written four major grant applications and brought in over $1,600,000 for land purchases. And I, having run a nonprofit, know just how impressive that amount is, not only writing it, but getting it and managing those grants because you're not done just because you get the money. And so um, how, how did you learn how to do this so well? <laughs> I, in graduate school, we had to do a business plan. And that's pretty much what these grants are. You're okay. writing a business plan. Okay. You're answering the questions that are proposed, and for a state Department of Energy Environmental Protection grant, uh, there's a tremendous amount of information they need. A lot need. of detail. And it starts with a big investment on our part. We have to provide two yellow book appraisals, and that costs us about eight to nine thousand dollars. So even before we even know we're going to get a grant, we have to put that money up front. Okay. And uh, eventually we'll have to have a survey, but the survey could wait till after you get the money. You, you get the money, yeah. right? But that can be thirty thousand dollars. Yes. It's so it's 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 not for the faint of heart. Um, it takes a lot of money and time to save land. Yes. And uh, I would say my grant applications are about that thick between appraisals, surveys, title search. That's mm -hmm. another maybe thousand um, mm -hmm. dollars. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we hire, usually, we've hired a biologist or we get, and also we get uh, members of the community, um, ornithologists, uh, experts, geologists, to give us reports. Mm -hmm. So uh, we put all of that information into the grant to justify why this is worth protecting. Okay, and so, so the Haley Farm, and we've talked about the Haley Farm and Bluff Point, but tell us what made the uh, Merritt Family Forest property such an important acquisition. Okay, the Mer Merritt Family Forest, number one, is was a key piece in the green belt that goes across Scrotton. And I think I we th have a map of the Crosstown Trail. Yeah, I think there is that. a map that'll come up. So there it is. Okay, there okay. it is. There it is. Uh, okay. So you can see, starting on the left, there's Bluff Point State Park. Uh -huh. And then it goes across the railroad tracks and into Haley Farm. Okay. And you can see we have a trail that connects it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we added, this on the Haley Farm story, 57 upper acres were added about 25 years later. It took that okay. long to get those. You cross one street and you end up in the Mortimer Wright Nature Preserve. Okay, so that's on the that's right. town owned on right. the right yeah. hand side. Mm -hmm. And then it connects up, that's town owned land, that little white spot. It's not protected open space, but it is okay. owned. And then the yellow is the Merritt Family Forest. That's at the top of the ridge. And it's okay. a green belt, not only for trails, as you can see it goes across, but it's uh -huh. also um, for wildlife corridors. The wildlife need lots of land to Yeah, talk move. about that a little bit, because that's part of what makes this so unique and so valuable, is that all of these pieces are connected and gives wildlife the range. Mm -hmm. So 
so if they're, for example, if on the one of the vernal pools on the Merritt family, or on, yeah, on the Merritt family forest, if one of those vernal pools had a bad season and species did not survive, if you have a connection that connects the habitats, then that more can migrate in from another area, and mm -hmm. it keeps genetic diversity for the amphibians and other wildlife that are in there. So if you had an isolated pocket of forest, the species would not do well, unless they're birds and they can fly. fly. Right, but the landlocked land landlock ones are much healthier mm -hmm. with the wide ecosystem, with being able to migrate, to find different sources of food, to interbreed. Uh -huh. uh, so, and, okay. and to have a variety of habitats, forests, fields, okay. wetlands. So let's go but drop back into the Merritt Forest okay. itself then. Okay. Okay, the Merritt Family Forest itself has uh, Eccleston Brook, a major stream that also connects all of these parcels. And, and it, it goes, and into, it goes in, into Palmer Cove right by Haley Farm. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Merritt also has several large wetlands and, as I told you, vernal pools. If you go out now, the wood frogs are migrating to the pools to deposit their eggs. And Explain what's in a vernal pool for our viewers. Okay, a vernal pool is a depression that is usually only temporarily wet during the rains in the springtime. And the amphibians, such as the wood frog and spotted salamanders, are can only breed in those pools. There have to be no fish, and that's why they don't breed in streams and other areas. The fish areas. eat the eggs. The fish will eat the eggs. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. So they, on the first warm days of spring, which is happening early this year, mm -hmm. they migrate out of the woods into the pools to deposit the eggs. And if you go to visit these sites, you can actually see them. The spotted salamander eggs look like fuzzy golf balls and the wood frog eggs look sort of like bubble wrap floating on the surface. And, they, and they're attached, they, the eggs are attached to each other, so it's a okay. big mess. Big family. So I, yeah, I encourage you to go off the trail a little bit and seek out these vernal pools. If you hear something that sounds like a duck in the woods, a flock of ducks, that's probably the wood frogs right now. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> that's great. The peepers are out there, too. Well, the you know, are at there night, too. you hear all of these sounds in the springtime, and I have no clue what they are, but it's a real cacophony of, uh, it's like a symphony of um, animals at night. Yeah. Yes, the tree frogs, that's what we call the peepers. They right. make a shrill, loud noise. Yes. But that doesn't work very well when you have a plan for 79 houses on the Merritt family forest, and the whole thing is clear-cut and covered with uh, roofs and driveways, concrete. you then ha and right. concrete, you've then done away from all of those sounds right. at oh, yes. the Merritt. We need to back up and say there was a subdivision plan, plan. for, it started out at 79 houses uh -huh. and with a crossing of the stream and filling of the, of the stream to put a culvert in. Mm -hmm. So that's how we started is protesting it, mainly trying to, we intervened to try to get a better plan with less less density, paved, less, right. density less, less paved paving. surface, mm -hmm. better drainage plans. And then, well, and then, Grace Lynn, what we would do is we would hire experts to come and, and make a presentation to the, uh, the local commissions who are volunteers, basically sure. giving them a 101 mm -hmm. in how much distance you have from a vernal pool that the salamanders need to then go to go back into the woods after they've laid their eggs. Mm -hmm. So you can't have the road go next to the vernal pool. You've got to give them 50 or 100 feet. So basically all of, all of the land that we bought, we have hired experts to... You had to educate the community. Yes. yes. And right. the commissions. And the commissions mm -hmm. to understand why preserving open space and not having everything paved over yes. uh, is so yeah. critical to... Yes the future of um, these wildlife, but also our future. Yeah. That's right. And this information was welcomed by the commissions. They yes. would tell us, keep that information coming. Good. They would get the, the applicant's expert, the developer's expert, uh, and they really needed to hear the information, the complete story by an, an un unbiased uh, outside, outer, of, right. outside expert. Well, let's move on because we've got about 10 more minutes and okay. I want to ask you what was special about the 63-acre sheep farm 
on Fishtown Road. What made that your next uh, acquisition? Let me you tell you, this. this is my favorite property. If you walk on that property within the first few minutes of arriving at the parking lot, you'll see how beautiful it is. And even a 90-year-old who can only go a few hundred feet will have a lot of diversity to see. And within an hour, you can do a, pr a pretty quick loop that shows you you have beautiful fields, you have an old house foundation. Front. We have the deed showing it was there in 1754. There's the remains of an old grist mill. There's a waterfall. Uh, Fort Hill Brook is absolutely stunning. Uh, it's just everyone has a wonderful feeling of well-being when they're there, looking mm -hmm. over the fields. The Put rock back formations back are gorgeous. Back in touch with the earth. Absolutely. Even in winter is gorgeous because that's when you see all the rock formations and the stone walls that go up and over the rocks and the cliffs. That are that. hidden in the summer with all the foliage. With the foliage, that's right. Yes, right. yes. I love driving yeah. around in the winter because you can see things that you that's don't know right. are there yes. otherwise. Yeah. And all of these properties are somewhat connected and available to people who maybe don't have transportation. They're close to neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're open to the public. And they're open to the public, yes, forever. free of charge, for walking, protected hiking. forever. Yeah. Yes. All of the properties that we have purchased have a conservation easement held by the state. So even if we were in financial difficulty and the lands were sold, the conservation easement goes with the property. So, so they can the, never be developed. It can be, never be developed. Never. Right. A conservation right. easement is, is a wonderful um, creation for people who want to um, preserve the land in perpetuity, so yes. it's forever. Yes. That's great. Um, how do you hear about these properties coming for sale? Do people come to you and tell you about it, or do you go find property that that you most of, most want? of all um, we've searched it out. Sometimes uh, in the early stages, we were more reactive. We'd see mm -hmm. the surveyors' tapes. We mm -hmm. go, "What's going on?" We go look at it and go, "Oh, whoa." And we found now it's much better to be proactive. And instead of trying to stop a, a development when the train has left the station, uh -huh. it's much better to be proactive, identify valuable pl places, early and on. The, early on mm -hmm. negotiate. Keep keep an, We have our eye on several different properties, and mm -hmm. we're just negotiating for the right timing, the right seller, the right price, the right opportunity, and we're prepared to jump on it if and it comes up. You had other acquisitions that you've made that yes. we haven't had time to talk about. Yes, Let's but the, just but, talk. the but to add to that, mm -hmm. the after we had bought Candlewood Ridge, um, uh, Judy Avery, the Avery Farm, her mm -hmm. father back in very early 1900s, as a young man, started buying little farms. This is you know everybody is going broke fast. Uh -huh. And so when she saw what we had been doing, she came to us and she says, I have nightmares that this is going to be developed the way it is in the town into plats. Mm -hmm. And I would so love to save this for open space. And mm -hmm. that is why we mm -hmm. had such a, she, we have such a wonderful relationship with Judy. And if you go on our website, you see the signing of the property that we now own 305 acres, half in Groton and half in Ledger, up on Lambtown. So Road. your reputation is now making a preservation a lot easier because people know what you do and yes. how well you do and, it. And yes. she saw us working on the Kenwood Ridge yes. and understood that our intentions were, were good. Good. And let me say, she donated the Groton acres. Oh my goodness! That's I wonderful. think it's 156. After the survey, we found we had more acres, but it was 156 acres that she donated, and we paid for the one the acres that were in Ledger. Mm -hmm. okay. So it was a, a so, wonderful win-win situation. She was happy her land was protected, and you were happy. Uh, to we be were able happy to protect, to protect, protect 305 acres next to the Kenwood Ridge, which so is 91 acres. That's 400. So all of these acreage. Total, in total, how many acres have you protected? Uh, 544 prop, uh, acres we own, mm -hmm. and 1,000 acres between Haley Farm and Bluff Point, which we are instrumental in saving. Mm -hmm. And we have another project coming up. Um, it can be public knowledge because we have an agreement. Um, what's called the Tilcon property. It's mm -hmm. a, a pitch pine, rare pitch pine forest on 201 acres, and we've 
uh, got the state will granite, buy it. Granite quarry. Uh, yeah, it has granite quarries. Um, and we will raise the matching funds. Okay. Sort of kind of like the same deal we did with Haley Farm. And then we are almost out of time. We've okay. We've got two minutes. So what I would like to do is um, just let you sort of tell viewers what they can do to help you uh, support Gosha. The first thing that everyone should understand is this is run totally by volunteers. We don't own a telephone or an office. We are run by volunteers. And this is the land that is being saved for everybody out there and their children and their grandchildren. And so we could use help. If they want to make a difference, we need help out in the field. You need physical volunteers. It's, it's time and money, both. Okay, because the, the properties need to be maintained. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. And so the volunteers do that maintenance. Yes. Mm -hmm. You have school programs. Talk yes. quickly about the school programs. Well, the school program is uh, is um, was started by uh, Sima Eben and uh, a teacher at Kualnaski, and Sima being a, a board board of directors member, and they started the first after school program and they have were given backpacks and the school let them have iPads have to there. get out yeah. to get out into the wilderness. The kids were scared to go out there. In the wild. In the wild. Yes. And suddenly when they were told to go and find take some pictures out there, then they got turned on. And fifteen only could be um, used the first year and and many turned away. The next year it was double that amount. This year we'll have even more than that. And so and so you need adult volunteers to help with the school programs. Everything. Absolutely. And you need... Um... Oh, and we have a gala coming up on the 21st, our fundraising okay. gala. That's a dinner at... 21st uh, of April. April 2016. At the Marriott. Pull okay. together a table, bring your friends. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and if you haven't received an, uh, an invitation, go to our website because it's there. The website's up on the screen right now and telephone number. Mm -hmm. And so... Become what? engaged. I, yes, and I ask all of viewers to please become engaged because open space, preserving open space is possible now where we are in this geographic area. But um, if you live in southern Connecticut where everything is so developed, it's almost unavailable. So what we're preserving now is really important to preserve it now while it's still undeveloped yes. and available. Yes. Even though it's expensive, it's That's still right. there. Yes. And so please... Give your time, if you, uh, give money if you can, uh, give your ideas. Become a member. Become a member. Yes. Uh, and We need those numbers. Yes. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in uh, and you're preserving these uh, wildlife habitat and you are preserving property for our own use of future generations. Thank you so much, both of you, for your work is wonderful. Your years of effort is amazing. And I am so grateful to what you do. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Grayson. We'll give you a tour. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Any place you'd like. We know it. <laughs> Good night. And thank you for viewing. Mm -hmm.